Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our second uh, CRRT webinar. Last month, we have our first workshop, which is a virtual CRRT workshop. And today, that's um, the second session. And here, we are focusing on CRRT machine alarms and troubleshootings. Um, I am Amr Hosseini. I'm the um, Fellowship Program Director, and our guest speaker today is Dr. Kamer El Attar. And uh, we have two uh, moderators, uh, Dr. Jacob uh, from Spain and Dr. Craig from South Africa. And uh, here is the meeting agenda. I'm just going to give you a very brief uh, introduction about the program. And uh, we are going to play the recorded video of the workshop. Then I will let Jacob and Greg to moderate the discussion with Dr. Kamel al -Attar. As you know, we choose the critical care nephrology training program for one year fellowship because these cases are critically ill patients who usually need the multidisciplinary team approach. These are challenging cases, and if not treated appropriately, will have devastating consequences. And there is a huge management gap between developing and developed countries, and there is no consensus, consistency or consensus in management of many of these cases. We really in need for expertise and to train trainers and to educate and uh, um, you know train um, good uh, critical care nephrologists in the Middle East, in Asia, in Africa, and most of the countries. And we choose uh, this approach of uh, 16 weeks module, and this fellowship is three modules, so it's uh, uh, almost one year long, and it's not based on one-way direction of education, but it's a dialogue between the tutors and the fellows. It's uh, not uh, based on webinar or seminar, but based on a smart platform with several clinical case scenarios, MCQs, journal clubs, and uh, lectures as well. Because if you tell me something, probably I'm going to forget it, but if you involve me and educate me and let me be uh, part of the active process of learning, probably I could retain this educational materials. Um, again, this is very interesting program. We are also uh, teaching how to critically think and to do a critical appraisal in this complicated cases and all the materials are uh, uploaded in a smart platform and all of the activities and engagement of our fellows are monitored by the tutors and the instructors. We started the fellowship May 20th, 2024. And uh, next month on September 16, we are starting our second module, but also we are starting a small batch of fellows with a brand new uh, fellowship. So there will be the vast majority of the fellows will be starting module two, but also will have newcomers who are going to start module one. So if you haven't uh, uh, apply for our fellowship yet, you still have a chance. The deadline is August 15, so next week. So please finalize your application. Here is the syllabus and the curriculum of uh, our fellowship. We started by introduction of the critical care nephrology. Then we uh, focused on the acid base, the volume assessment, AKI, then CRRT for three weeks. And uh, today we have our second webinar, then we'll have the final um, module exam for the next three weeks. Then we are going to start our next module in September. We are going to focus on sepsis, polytrauma, rhabdo, abdominal compartment, 
and uh, uh, we are going to have another uh, workshop on Wednesday, October 9th. So please mark your agenda. We will have Dr. Craig at the Street, the regional uh, street anticoagulation. That's very important, how to apply and disseminate this knowledge and how to create uh, uh, protocols and policies for regional street anticoagulation. So please mark your agenda. Then we are going to focus on multi-organ failure with liver failure, uh, Mars, albumin, uh, hemoperfusion, uh, cardiorenal syndrome, aquaphoresis, um, nutrition and critical elevations, drugs and toxins. And the last uh, module will be focusing on advanced training. We'll start with electrolyte urgencies and emergencies, pediatric critical care nephrology, ethics and palliative care, uh, point of care ultrasound, renal replacement therapy with various left ventricular assisted device, ECMO machine, plasma exchange, critical care nephrology during pandemic and natural disasters, imaging technology and novel treatment modalities and the implication of artificial intelligence in critically ill patients. One more announce, announcement before I will leave you with the workshop. Uh, we have uh, on uh, Wednesday, August 28th, an international uh, webinar. We invited Pierre Ronco, who is the editor of uh, the International Society of Nephrology Journal, the Kidney International Journal, and also Georgina Bicoli. She is the editor of uh, the Italian um, Journal of Nephrology. And uh, Ifima from Nigeria, um, Rasha Samir from Egypt, and we'll have a um, very uh, big international meeting about membrane nephropathy and bodocytopathy, the updates on this uh, uh, two um, diseases. Again, the graduation day uh, would be May 5th, 2025. So please mark your uh, calendar and uh, congratulations for those who are finishing module one and uh, starting module two um, next month. And they are going to uh, graduate and receive American Association of Continuing Medical Education certification by May 5th, 2025. Um, I'm going to stop by here and uh, we are going to start uh, the workshop. We are going to play uh, parts of the workshop. It will be about five parts. The first part will be an introduction of the CRRT and uh, we are going to open the floor for discussion after uh, each part. So if you have any questions, please put your questions, share your questions or concerns in the chat box. And we are going to share the screen and show you the first part of the workshop. We have Dr. Kamil al Attar with us. He is going to answer the questions. We have Dr. Jacob and Dr. Craig they are going to handle the question and moderate the session. Rola, please. There is no voice. Rola, stop share and share with the voice, with the audio and try to see how these CRRT alarms relate to our CRT prescriptions and how we as physicians can do things differently built on the CRRT alarm. CRRT alarms relate to our CRT prescriptions. And uh, for this practical session titled the CRRT alarms for physicians, uh, we will attempt to, uh, to go through a case study and try to see how these CRRT alarms relate to our CRT prescriptions and how we as physicians can do things differently built on the CRRT alarms uh, that we get during the treatment. Now, historically, uh, nurses have been the ones already and they will continue to be the ones handling the CRRT machine and the CRRT machine alarms. But there is a role for the physician uh, in order to modify the prescription uh, to help have a better outcome uh, uh, for those patients. A 52-year-old female patient admitted to the OR uh, for removal of uterine fibroid. Fourier alert, MAP 100, serum creatinine 
all other preoperative lambs are normal. During the operation, she shows excessive bleeding during the procedure and receives three units of, of blood intraoperatively. Mokrib drops to seven, creatinine is now 1.2 milligram per deciliter, and she passes around 500 ml of urine in the past six hours. Now, her blood pressure drops further, and her MAP is now 65. Admitting intensivist starts fluid as the resuscitation administers two units of blood. Uh, uh, six hours later, her lab is reading hematocrit 31%, hemoglobin 7.7 gram, TLC 7,500, Greatly count 220,000. Uh, serum creatinine is now 2.2 milligram per deciliter. Lactate level is 4. And, and, and bicarbonate is 18 millimoles. Potassium is now 5.5, but the urine output is still the same. Now you have the evening shift. You come in and you find that your colleague has already started CRRT with the following prescription. Now, through his training, education, uh, he prescribes a CVHDF prescription, uh, blood pump on 20 ml per minute. Dial is 8750 ml per hour, uh, pre dilution at 370 ml per hour, post dilution at 375 ml per hour. Uh, he uh, describes half of the dose as, as dialysate, half of it as replacement, uh, half of that replacement he wants to do in pre dilution, uh, half of that he wants to do in post dilution. He also uh, prescribes zero heparin, of course, because uh, the patient is. Uh, 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 is an active bleeding. Uh, uh, he does prescribe zero UF because there is no overload, uh, and and he prescribes potassium to uh, solutions. From the case simulation, remember that prescription was blood pump speed one twenty. Remember the pre blood pump was at three hundred seventy. We remember the dialysate was seven fifty. and the replacement was uh, also uh, 350. So this was how the prescription looked like. Of course, confirming what parameters, uh, we also look at heparin. We agreed, zero heparin prescription. Uh, of course, confirming that this is how the CRT prescription looked like on the main screen. Blood pop 120, pre-dilution 370, uh, 750 dialysate, uh, 350 post total dialysis dose uh, you can see uh, was 30 ml per kg and uh, filtration fraction uh, is 14 percent continue and uh, of course this is now where we start connecting the patients here is the main screen as you can see all the parameters on the main screen you can see here uh, all the pressures and the parameters with of course zero uh, anticoagulation uh, for that case. Very nice. Craig, what do you think about this uh, dialysis prescription? Okay, so um, hello everyone. Nice to see you all. And um, yeah, so this is a very uh, typical and interesting case, one that I'm, I'm sure we've seen many, many times. The scenario obviously is quite unique in the sense that you've got a patient who's becoming acutely unstable and a patient who's actively had surgery and is a very, very high risk for bleeding. So you almost have no other option but to choose a dialysis treatment modality, first of all, where you cannot use an anticoagulation a strategy, um, at least an active one, such as the use of, of, of heparin. Um, and, uh, you know, with the choices of no heparin, my, my opinion and my, my approach to this kind of patient is always to ask myself, first of all, as we've said in, as I said in my lecture, do you really, do you really want to use continuous treatment? And um, because, you know, you're going to have a hard time keeping this dialysis prescription going if you're not able to anticoagulate your circuit. So that's the first point. But importantly also is, um, you know, you're going to have to choose your modality, that being CVVHD versus CVVHDF and a mixture of pre-dilution or post-dilution or a mixture of both. And, you know, in a patient who is bleeding or is at high risk of bleeding, you always have to just remember that whatever filtration fraction we apply to the circuit is going to have additional um, you know, additional uh, risks for this clot, for this filter 
the lifespan to be reduced in clots. So some people in this instance might decide to just go with CVVHD, anticipating that because we're not using any dialysis, uh, any anticoagulation, that we're going to run into a problem. And I think that's an important thing to do. You've got to think ahead with all your dialysis prescriptions. You've got to be two steps ahead of what's going to happen in this case. You know that you're not going to give anticoagulation, so you've got to prepare a pre prescription that is most likely to last as long as possible. And uh, some people may choose to just do CVVHD. Jacobo, what do you think? Well, we are we're going to talk about this uh, next uh, 60 minutes about the troubleshooting. Um, and when we're talking about the troubleshooting, we are going to talk about something that is wrong on the machine. And in order to know what's going on and if we have trouble or no, the first thing we have to bear in mind and we have to know is that uh, there are some uh, alarms on the machines that will help us in order to realize if the things if the things are, are going properly or improperly. Now, there are three, five different kinds of alarms on the machine. Uh, the first one is alarm on the pressure on the, on the access uh, line, uh, which is, is the pressure uh, on the blood coming from the, the body and into the machine. And this pressure, as you all know, is negative because we are pulling the blood from inside the pressure from inside the, the, the body into the, um, into, the, into the machine. The second or the other alarm is the alarm on the blood pressure exactly on the other side, on the opposite side of the machine, on the return side. Okay, the pressure on that uh, side of the, of, the, of the machine is a positive pressure because we are not pulling, we are pushing the, the, uh, the blood from inside the machine into the, into the body. That's the reason why it is positive. No? The, the second alarm is the pressure inside the filter. The third alarm is the, uh, the air leak. The fourth alarm is the, 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 um, the, the blood leak and, and the five. And the fifth uh, alarm is, is no other rather than the, than the disconnection, uh, disconnection uh, system. Now, the first thing to bear in mind the fear, and the first thing we have to know is how to look or how to identify these different alarms and how to use them in order to realize if the things are going properly or not. That's the first thing. The second thing is, yeah, what we have to do, what we do want to do in this specific patient. I mean, we, I want to, to, I want the convention, I want the, 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 the diffusion, I, I want to withdraw water from the patient, I want to dialyze uh, the, the patient, what, what do I want to do? For example, in this specific play, in this specific patient, uh, the patient obviously is in shock. We have to bear in mind that we have to be very careful with the with the blood pressure of the patient. If we withdraw a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of water from inside, probably we, we increase that that uh, that blood pressure that uh, uh, decrease on the on the blood pressure. So, the second thing is that. Uh, uh, the dialyzed in this specific case, from my point of view, it seems to be like uh, very, very slow, very low, very low. Maybe, maybe we will need to to increase in order to uh, to restore the the, the, the kidney function. Um, and the third point, yeah, is is the problem with the anticoagulation because we all will is is. It's one of the on the concerns that we all have always the the, the anticoagulation. Do we have to do it? Can we do it? It's regional. It's systemic. Okay, and it's it's a very tricky question. It's a very 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 difficult situation. So from a point of view, these are the 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 main things. First, to look at the alarms and to how uh, and to know how to interpret the the different alarms. And the second one, what do I want to do with my patient? Or in other words, what is, what does the patient needs? That's my 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 approach, my general approach at the beginning of the of the of the session. Very nice, very nice, Doctor Atar. I have a question for you, and uh, again, welcome and thank you so much for this uh, very nice presentations and virtual workshops. So my questions for you is about the starting dose of the uh, starting uh, blood flow rate of the uh, CRRT machine. I think in the past they used to say you know 80 uh, ml per minute or something like that uh, but uh, uh, are you still using this very low blood flow rate at initiation regardless the hemodynamics or are you trending up with the qb 
Um, thank you, Dr. Amr, for this question. And um, I was always glad to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to, uh, to be a, a part of the World Kidney Academy activities. Uh, this specific case, of course, is a, um, is a case model that we have built to try to open the topic of uh, CRRT alarms. We will try to see that, uh, you know, later on in the case, we will develop some of the access and the pressure alarms, and we will try to handle those and so on. Um, the patient is very small, as you can see, she's uh, around 50 kilos. The dose is 30 ml per kg per hour, so we're talking about a total dose of 1.5 liters. Half of it pre, uh, half of it dialysate, half uh, uh, in terms of convection, the convection, half of it pre and half of it. So this is just one of the very common scenarios we see inside the ICU of a small patient with high bleeding risk, uh, zero anticoagulation protocol. Uh, for the purpose of the training, uh, it is not a citrate case, it's a heparin-free case, so it's a heparin anticoagulation protocol. And uh, for that uh, purpose of the uh, training, we assumed a very low blood pump of 120 uh, to be able to see the restrictions of uh, blood pump speed. Uh, going to the blood pump speed uh, question, uh, the real one, should we start at very low blood pump speeds? Um, yes, we should uh, uh, and take off and landing. So when you're connecting the patient, first time the blood is leaving the patient and going into the circuit, this is the time when we are concerned about the blood pump speed because it is as if you are bleeding out the patient at a certain rate. And that's where the convention of what Dr. Amber explained, we start at 30 ml per minute and we gradually go to 100, 120, 150 until we reach the final blood pump speed. So the takeoff period of actually patient connection, we do start at very low blood pump because we are taking the blood out of the circuit. Uh, the same is with the return. When you're returning the blood to the patient, then we also return the blood very slowly. We return it at a rate, uh, uh, for example, 100 or 80 ml per minute, so that the blood is coming to the circulation. You're adding the extracorporeal volume, which is 250 uh, or 300 ml, to the patient as if you are transfusing 300 or 250 ml, then we might as well transfuse them slowly. But if when the circuit is closed, when, the, when we start the CRRT, increasing the blood pump speed uh, sh should not lead to a drop in the blood pressure of the patient. And, and, and uh, you know, unlike most doctors uh, uh, would assume, going a blood pump 200, uh, you have a lower blood pressure than 150. This is, uh, there is no, no, no science supporting that because the circuit is actually closed. There is no blood either leaking out or coming in to the circuit. It's a close circuit. Very nice, very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, we don't have any uh, question in the chat box. I think we can move on to the second part of the recorded workshop. 12 hours into CRRT, her labs are serum creatinine, two milligram per deciliter, potassium 5.5. Now, what changes to the CRRT station would you make? Now, remember, creatinine was 2.2. 12 hours into CRT, it's still 2 milligram per deciliter. Potassium was 5.5. 12 hours into CRT, it's still 5.5 millimoles. So I'm not, you know, not satisfied with the clearance uh, of the treatment so far. Now, from our training, uh, we know that there are two things, the CRRT dose uh, and the blood pump speed. In CRRT, the number one factor that would improve the clearance uh, of molecules is increasing the CRRT dose. So instead of prescribing 30 ml per kg per hour, patient 50 kilos, well, we're talking about 1.5 liters, uh, one would prescribe maybe two liters uh, per hour uh, in terms of a CRRT dose, uh, making up to 40 uh, ml per kg uh, per hour. Uh, of course, increasing blood pump speed will improve clearances, uh, but it is, would be the secondary to increasing uh, the uh, CRRT dose. So the right answer is probably increasing the CRRT dose from 30 to 35 or 40 ml uh, per kg per hour. You decide to go on the machine. You decide to, uh, uh, in this case, go to adjust. You try to increase the, as we explained, the dose from 30 ml per kg per hour to 40 ml per kg per hour. Patients 50 kilos, so we talk about two liters. One liter in dialysate, one liter, uh, half a liter in pre and half a liter in post. So when you go to the uh, pre-blood pump, you want to make that 500. 
when you go to the dialysate, you want to make that one liter. You go to replacement, you want to make that 500. Uh, and then you confirm that. You see that, of course, the dose has increased to 38 ml per kg per hour, which is a much higher dose. And we still have decent filtration fraction at 19%, but remember, this is a zero heparin prescription. Blood pump is so low. Maybe one decides to increase the blood pumps due to lower filtration fraction, but also to increase the clearance. As we said, it is secondary to increasing the CRT dose. So you go to adjusting uh, and you increase the blood pump speed, for example, uh, uh, to 140. Uh, you can see here a better filtration fraction, uh, but also a uh, better clearance. Very nice, very nice. Greg, do you have any questions in the chat box? Um, I see no questions at the moment. Um, maybe I can just make a comment. So, um, you know, this, uh, what Dr. Uh, Kamala has brought up here is, you know, how do you monitor the effectiveness of your dialysis um, of your CRT circuit, especially, you know, if you have various specific goals, for instance, potassium reduction, bicarbonate correction, um, you know, it's it's different in different groups. You know, I, uh, you know, some people want to see a very, uh, you know, a very steady uh, reduction in the urea, for instance. But I think what must always be kept in mind is that if you're choosing CRRT, you are choosing a very low efficiency um, uh, a mechanism of the, uh, delivering dialysis. And with that, the clearances are extremely low. So one must be very careful in, in trying to uh, anticipate something that the machine cannot offer. If you're dialyzing a patient with a pump speed of 120 and, uh, and dialysates flowing over that blood of uh, in the order of uh, 30 or so moles per, moles, per minute, um, moles per minute, which is what you're getting from about 200, uh, 2,000, 1,500 moles per hour, that is extremely low efficiency dialysis. So we must be careful not to blame the dialysis machine for not working well enough if we're trying to, to correct the potassium within four, five, or six hours. It's just not going to happen. You have to be, this is a form of treatment that you have to give time and uh, you know, adjusting dialysate flows and, 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 your, and your replacement fluids may be one of the ways of getting there a little bit quicker but you can't really expect the same from CVB HDF or HD or whatever as you would from a, a conventional intermittent uh, treatment session. I have, okay. Craig, did you finish? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay, yeah, I, I completely agree with you because uh, in most of the cases, we are asking for something this, that is completely impossible. Impossible. I, I, I mean, you have to handle the situation. You have to play between the, the patient's hemodynamics and the and the and the and the and the, and the, and the dialysis potential. But trying to get there with a, a very low uh, ball pump is, is 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 very difficult. That's the reason why, for example, in my unit, we are we are using other kind of 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 renal replacement therapy. I mean, not the conventional, but the SLED. Uh, and we are trying to run away from the continuous renal replacement therapy. But the problem is that in some situations when you are in shock, in, in the refractory shock, septic shock is, is very difficult to use the, the, the SLED. But uh, I completely agree with you with the fact that we have to realize that the, that the machine has the limitations and we cannot ask for something completely impossible. And I have, I have a question for Professor Kamal, which is, um, a, a very simple. Um, as you all know, in the current literature, uh, there is a huge controversy when they talk about the, the 30 mLs per kilogram dialysis, and, and we try to move into the 35 or the 40. I mean, it seems that there is a, a very uh, a very big difference, or, or there is not a, a, a huge difference when we increase from the 30 into the 35 or, or, the, or the 40 mLs per kilogram. But on the other hand, it's something that we all do it. 
because because as, as you said on the on the on the on the webinar, I mean you have to handle the situation and you realize that after maybe 10, 11, 15, 14 hours, the situation is, is, is pretty much the same. I mean the, the acidosis continues and the and the kidney in the kidney is, is not is not getting is not getting uh, getting better. So what's your opinion about about this uh, this um, about this this topic? What do you think about increasing about the 30? Uh, into the 35 or the 40 or even higher to the 45 ml, ml per kilogram because uh, again the current literature too they say that there is not a, a, a very good advantage but at the end of the day it's something that we all do it again and again and again and it's working at least for me so professor kamal what, what do you think about this, <laughs> about this? i mean it's, it's a trick <laughs> exactly and it's working yeah yeah <laughs> professor Jacobo, thank you very much and it's working and that's what we do so you don't like the clearance what you do you increase the dose uh, though, you know, we know from the big randomized controlled trials that there is no mortality or morbidity benefit uh, for, uh, you know, doing a 40 or a 50 or a 60 ml per kg per hour in adult population. Uh, we still go ahead and increase the dose. I think your question is about individualization. So uh, when we have a case in the ICU, uh, we have a protocol sometimes, a standard protocol for all patients. Let's say uh, a CVV HDF protocol with a specific blood pump speed that we would think works for most patients. And uh, that is a standard. You write it like in a sort of a um, uh, instruction to the nurses. The nurses apply it for the big patients, the small patients, everyone it works. Uh, in some cases, even though this patient's only 50 kilos, uh, uh, when you apply the protocol, it's not good enough. Uh, she or he may have a higher metabolic needs and uh, maybe, you know, having a higher demand uh, for RRT than the other patient. And therefore, individualization of that patient going from 30 to 35 to 40 for this patient in this period of time uh, may offer uh, a benefit uh, of clearance. This is very difficult to elicit in the randomized control trial because randomized control trials, they would, you know, you have a, a two groups of patients randomly assigned to uh, to a high, high dose or low dose uh, and very difficult to find a mortality or mobility difference uh, between both groups. So my, my answer to the question in the adult population uh, is individualization. So uh, protocol works for 80% of the cases. Uh, if it doesn't work, your training uh, should take you into making decisions to tailor or adjust the prescription in order to achieve what you want to achieve now in the next six hours. Maybe after six hours, clearance is good. You want to go back to your 30. That's fantastic. But for this period of time, uh, I don't see us doing much clearance. 12 hours in uh, CRT, labs are not going down. Uh, uh, this may indicate uh, low efficiency or much lower, as uh, Dr. Craig mentioned. We are very, we're in a very low area of efficiency as to start with uh, from the beginning of this uh, of this therapy. Professor, that's that's exactly that's exactly the the, the, the answer I wanted individualization because the problem is that in most of the cases the people holds the protocol and follows the protocol blindly, but it's absolutely mandatory to bring the protocol to the patient, not the patient to the protocol, not, not, not exactly the other way around. And to get there, and to get there is absolutely essential to know what we are doing. And that's the reason why we have to understand the whole machine and, and, the, and the, whole, the whole thing. I would have like, like, a, like, a, like a, a scope view, because you are right, in the 70 or maybe or the 80% of the patient, everything is, is, is easy, it's easy. I mean, it's just, it's running and going on and things just, Go on the right side, but the problem is with the with the other twenty or thirty percent. And in most of the situations, the only way to know what to do is doing, <laughs> is doing, uh, or, or or trying or trying, and again to individualize what we are trying to do with that patient in order what the patient needs. As is 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 absolutely absolutely mandatory. And again, we have to bear in mind that every time in intensive care uh, world, we try to demonstrate a reduction in the mortality patient doing this or that, and whatever we are doing is is almost impossible because the relations between the different organs, the relation, the big picture is extremely complicated. I mean, I mean, so try to reduce the mortality in such a complicated patient is impossible. It's impossible. We are humans. <laughs> we are not. We are not gods. But again, the 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 um, uh, the, the um... The idea is to individualize, not to apply blind protocols. That's the reason why I, I, I ask you the, the, the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, just a quick question, Dr. Kamen. When you 
um, start prescribing CRRT and say, start with 25 or 30 ml per kg, uh, what uh, weight are you talking about? Is it the ideal body weight, the target body weight, um, the adjusted body weight, the patient, uh, you know, body weight uh, uh, at admission or after resuscitation? So how, you know, what, what kind of weight you are talking about? So the, uh, Professor Hosini, though, you know, we have the big three randomized control trials, the ATN, the renal, the Ibuari. They're the ones like uh, who, man, you know, who went through thousands of patients and they are the ones who randomized the uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 patients. We were looking at how they measured the dose in those studies because these studies were looking at CRT dose. And ideally, the right answer to the question would be the patient's dry weight, which is something we do not have in real life. So, you know, patient in the ICU is 80 kilos. Uh, uh, you know, you ask his, his children outside, uh, what was your father's weight at home? Uh, they say he was 70. So somehow he accumulated 10 liters of fluids in, in his last two days of stay in the ICU. What happened to him? Well, the emergency room doctor gave him a couple of liters. He went to the OR. He took a couple of liters. He came to the ICU. He's been doing 30 ml per kg uh, of IV fluids. By the time he reached the CRRT, uh, he was plus 10. And you be, you know, you treat him as if he's an 80 kilo patient, which is his actual weight at the time of RRT. Uh, he's a much, much smaller guy. He's a 70 kilo patient because that's his dry weight. So my... Uh, my short answer to the question, ideal, ideally, you would find the um, dry weight if you can. Uh, if you cannot, then use the actual. Uh, using the ideal body weight does not help us very much. Uh, I'm a big guy. My ideal body weight is maybe around 80 kilos. I'll never be 80 kilos, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm exercising, I'm losing weight, but I'm never going to be 80 kilos. If you dialyze me as if I was an 80 kilo patient, you prescribe me CVV HDF with 2.4 liters, it's not going to work. I'm a much bigger guy. I have a more higher metabolism. I'm never going to be in ventilation. I still have the same lung, so you can ventilate me as if I am uh, an 80 kilo guy. You can use my ideal. My ideal weight doesn't help very much. At least that's my take. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Craig. Yeah, I see um, we've got a few questions and uh, Dr. Khaled uh, is, is, uh, is answering them. It's just one question that's very interesting. And one of the, one of the uh, fellows are saying, why are we in such a hurry to reach our target? Uh, we can achieve with more time to avoid going against the protocol. I think that is exactly, exactly what we need, the approach we need to have with CVBH, with CRRT. However, there is a very important rider that goes with that because if we are, we must also be cognizant of the fact that our filter might clot, especially in no, no anticoagulation cases. So if you, you sometimes you're playing against time because uh, there's almost a sure chance that a patient who's not using anticoagulation will clot at some point within 24 hours. And so trying to achieve your targets has to be has to be in your in the, in your mind within a certain time if you're not going to use uh, regional citrate anticoagulation. And then there's another question about lactic acidosis, which you know your patient, this patient that we have had quite a bit of lactic acidosis. I think it's important to remember that lactic acidosis is not uh, correctable by uh, well, it's partially correctable, but it's been driven by uh, hypoxemia and 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 hemodynamic low flow issues. Which, is a, which, which you don't correct with dialysis, that you treat with hemodynamic treatment, correcting the blood pressure, making sure your inotropes are fine. Uh, there's a little bit of a misconception that we're gonna correct lactic acidosis with dialysis, which is not, not the truth. It's you correct lactic acidosis with, with, with good hemodynamic monitoring. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, I know, Dr. Greg, I'm sorry, to, I know where this comes from because lactic acid, is a, is a small molecule. It's a it's a it's a very tiny molecule. So yes, people do assume we clear it even by by intermittent hemodialysis because it's diffusion. It's a small molecule. We clear. The answer is yes, we can clear it because it's so small. But it will never be clinically effective because the factory is producing much more than what we can clear. Yeah. 
Yeah. So our clearance in RRT, no matter what, is it, whether it's intermittent or CRRT, can never even come close to the actual body production in a healthy individual, not to mention a septic individual where they will start producing 15 times fold as much mm -hmm. as we are producing. So yes, where the confusion always comes from. Yeah, yeah. yes. And we, also so have, and we also have to bear in mind with the lactic acidosis that it's not only... Is is not only about, about withdrawing from the body, but trying to stop the production. So if you want to treat the lactic acidosis, you have to focus on the disoxia, not 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 the renal replacement therapy. I agree com completely with you, Professor Kamel. I mean, it's 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 an a consequence. The renal replacement therapy will help a little, but just just that. I mean, I will never ever correct completely, completely. And that's but that's that's this this is extremely important because there's a lot of people thinking that okay don't worry about the acid lactic the lactic because I will connect it into the renal replacement therapy and suddenly the lactic will get control no 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 that's completely wrong <laughs> I mean it's impossible it's impossible very nice let's uh, replay the third part of the workshop and see how it goes decision was made to increase the CRT dose to become two liters per hour. Two liters divided by 50, that means 40 ml per kg per hour. Uh, you prescribed one liter of dialysate, you prescribed 0.5 liters in pre, 0.5 liters in post. And uh, through your training, you were able to also increase the blood pump speed to 150 ml per, meter, per minute to increase the clearance, but also to have lower filtration fractions. So remember the prescription now is one liter dialysate, uh, 0.5 pre and 0.5 post. 12 hours into CRRT, her access pressure uh, went from minus 100 to minus 60. What changes to the prescription would you make? For the next few minutes, we will put aside all our theoretical training, all our nephrology training, and we will focus on high school physics. We'll go back to just pure uh, pressure and physics. Now, for the next also few minutes, we will assume that I am the dialyzer. I am the filter. This is the access, and this is the return also known as arterial pressure and venous pressure. Always remember that access pressure is negative because of taking away blood from the patient. So remember that return pressure is always positive because of returning blood to the patients. Now, three reasons with, we could have high access pressure. What are these reasons? Well, high access pressure means that there is a block after. What could cause block after the pressure? Clot in the filter would be the most common. A clot in the venous chamber would also be very common. Or a block in the return, the blue, the venous needle. Again, three reasons would cause a rise in the access pressure. Number one, filter clotting. Number two, venous chamber clotting. Number three, the return access block. Now, three reasons would also cause low access pressure. Low access means that the negative access pressure, which is the most common alarm uh, you find in CRT. Mainly, you can see that where there is a access problem, where minus 100 becomes minus 150, where you are trying to get blood from the patient and failing. When do we see that? We see that in the block in the arterial needle or the block in the arterial part of the catheter or a kinking of the arterial line. These three causes would cause the access pressure to become more negative. Now, when it comes to pressure going from minus 100 to minus 60, is that an increase or a decrease in access pressure? The answer is, it is a rise in access pressure. Minus 60 is a higher number than minus 100. So what would a trained physician see when he has a rising access pressure. You would assume a clot in the filter or a block in the filter, a block in the venous chamber or a block in the return line or the uh, blue part of the return line. How can we differentiate that? If we see that accompanied by a drop in the return, so high access, low return can only mean one thing, that the filter itself is uh, the source of the pressure. So there is a pressure accumulating inside the filter. So what would the first thing I would do? I would check the return, see if the return is also becoming low, going from 100 to 50, for example. Then I've already diagnosed 
that the filter is the problem. Now, what kind of a problem is there in that filter? We have two major uh, causes that would cause the filter pressure to rise. Of course, the infamous filter clotting, which means that we have a clot being formed, blocking those hollow fibers and increasing the pressure. The transmembrane pressure rises uh, and therefore uh, causes these alarms. The second one is clogging. What is filter clogging? Filter clogging is accumulation of fats and proteins on the membrane of the dialyzer. This clogging will also result in the same alarms at the same pressures rise. How can a trained physician differentiate between a filter clotting and a filter clogging? Another parameter we look at on the machine, which is in this case, the filter pressure drop. Now, pressure drop is also displayed on the main screen, and it shows us the difference in the pressure between the filter inlets and the filter outlets. In normal CRT, there is always a difference between the filter inlet and the filter outlet because blood comes at a higher pressure in the inlet, and that pressure gradually declines as you go from the, the filter outlet. But in cases of clotting or clogging, there is a difference. Because clotting is an incident that happens in a specific part of the filter, it will cause a rise in the filter uh, drop pressure. Why? Because it's a specific block, there will be a higher pressure in the inlet and a lower pressure in the outlet. But if we look at the clogging, which is a homogeneous block of the filter from the inlet to the outlet, you will see that there is no uh, big uh, pressure drop. So the pressure drop number does not increase. The number will remain similar uh, or the same. So both conditions will cause rising transmembrane pressure. One of them will be causing a high pressure drop, the other will not. Very so nice. Very now nice. I realize it has clotting. As a physician, what kind of actions can I do? Well, we know it's clotting. Maybe I should modify the anticoagulation. Doing heparin anticoagulation, increase the dose. Of course, in this case, very difficult to do so. Increase the blood pump speed, in this case also, will help uh, uh, prevent the clotting. Also, go from 150 blood pump to maybe 170 or 180. One other thing I could do is increase the pre-dilution. So in this case, as a trained physician, I would increase the blood pump speed and increase the pre-dilution in anticipation of this clotting that could be happening inside the membrane. Remember, you just started the CRT, you don't know if this minus 100 uh, is good or bad. So you want to look at the history uh, of the pressures. How do we do that? We very simply uh, go on the machine, choose history, and from the history, we choose the pressures. And from the pressures, you can see the axis, the filter, the effluent, the return. So for example, uh, if you want to see the axis pressure, uh, you put them all like this, and you can see the history of the axis uh, where it was and started and where it is now. Same with TMP. You can choose TMP uh, or, or you can choose, as we explained, pressure drop. Uh, and that's what was very well explained. Of course, here, because it's a simulation, uh, there is saline, there is no human blood. I'm unable to see uh, transmembrane pressures, axis and return pressures as what you would see uh, in a normal clinic. So looking at the history of the pressures using the pressure uh, history menu, uh, you will be able to diagnose that this is a pressure accumulation problem. Now go back to uh, the uh, uh, CRT prescription. Uh, of course, the decision now, uh, as we explained, is to have more pre-dilution. Uh, uh, one of the things we adjust, we go to pre-dilution, uh, have the pre-dilution to be uh, uh, 750 uh, instead of 500, uh, but also uh, go away to the post-dilution uh, and make it less, so make it 250, for example, uh, and then also go to the blood pump, go from 140, for example, to 160. Uh, confirming all, you will see that we have, uh, in this case, uh, maintained a very high dialysis dose of 30 ml, which was which we want better clearance, but we were able to achieve a lower filtration fraction at 14%, uh, and, and to try to bypass this problem uh, uh, of the pressure 
the filter pressure accumulation uh, for this patient. Now, I'll Very nice. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the take home messages today is a prescription is not a static process. It's a dynamic process. We don't just initiate the patient on CRRT and let it go. We have, you know, initially every four to six hours, we have to reassess according to the clinical conditions, uh, laboratory status, our CRRT prescription. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I would like to just make two points. So first of all, with all these pressure pumps and all these uh, monitoring and all this technology that we have uh, right at our fingertips, I think it's, first of all, the principle is important that we not get too focused on absolute numbers, but rather than trends. So you need to really have a team, a dialysis team, a nursing staff and technical staff that is trained to not just call you when the, the number has reached a certain maximum value uh, and rather be more cognizant of what the trend is over time because you can do a lot when you see the number begin to go up but when you begin to uh, try to uh, respond to something that has already reached a uh, you know especially for instance transmembrane pressure you know we can we can teach and we can tell people listen you know, if the transmembrane pressure is over uh, 150 or 200, then then you you must wake up and let somebody know. But I think that's too late. It's better to actually uh, start start uh, uh, responding to it. And that that brings me to my second point. You know, we have to be we have to be slightly cleverer as as doctors. We have to be clever doctors as well as just normal doctors. We have to be able to anticipate what is going to happen in hours from now. So I would have, Dr. Kamal, I would have actually considered, seriously considered starting this patient with a very predominance of, of pre-dilution right from the start, knowing that, for instance, I'm not, I'm not adding anticoagulation, knowing my patient is quite septic, knowing that my filter is li very likely to start giving problems from about 12 to 16 hours onwards, I would have maybe taken the approach of doing as maximal pre-dilution as possible right from the very start. Because, you know, we don't have techniques of unfiltering, unclotting, fil uh, sorry, of unclotting a clotted filter. There is no such thing as trying to, uh, trying to reverse a clotted filter. You have to do that from the word go. And if, you, if your filter starts giving problems and the trends in the team piece go up, you're more likely than to just lose that filter very soon after, than to try and catch up and try and pre reverse what has already happened. Absolutely, Dr. Greg. Um, definitely, I would prescribe the same. Uh, it's a tutorial, so this case is built so that we open these discussions uh, that they would run into trouble, they would get alarms, and then they uh, she tried to change something. Uh, but Dr. Craig, what I'm trying to identify or uh, uh, to highlight here is the gap, the knowledge gap about doctors uh, with these pressures. When they get these oh. alarms at 4 a.m., uh, they don't want to, you know, they just say, okay, then disconnect the guy, the patient, tomorrow we will discuss and so on. Mainly because they have not received such training uh, about mm -hmm. what does it mean for a high access alarm versus a low access alarm, for example. And what can they do from their side uh, to improve the outcomes or, in this case, give us a few hours longer on the same dialysis. Um, my initial prescription would be uh, much more, you know, probably pre-dilution, much more diffusion, less convection. I don't see a huge need for a big uh, convection in this patient. Why 50% of the dose is convection? I don't see a big a big molecule problem uh, with this patient. So ideally, I would prescribe a high clotting risk prescription with high blood pump speed, a lot of pre-dilution, uh, and, uh, and less convection. Uh, uh, nevertheless, the trend, how many doctors today open the history of the screen to see the pressure of the axis uh, when we started uh, 18 hours ago until now. How many doctors look at the trend of the TMP? We started the session with TMP 50. Now we are 150. That's not good because that's tripling the TMP and, and, and the nurse and the doctor are doing nothing uh, because they're not observing that. Because if you just come in your shift in the morning and you see a transmembrane pressure of 100, you think it's fantastic. 
Uh, no, it's not. This guy started three hours ago with the MP50. Now it's 100. So the trend is more important than the number. You're absolutely right. But how many of us actually do check that? Look, I, I couldn't agree more with, with all of you because <clears throat> all of us, we want the magic button, the one that you press and something, everything happens, you know, and, and everything just is solved up. But that's impossible. I mean, that's not going to happen, never, ever. Um, the problem is that every time that we have faced a, a, a very a critical situation, we try to, to find <clears throat> a parameter, a number, something to hold on our, on, on our head in order to orientate the treatment. But any parameter in the intensive care world, and we are talking, uh, and, and no matter if we are talking about nephrology or ventilation or hemodynamics or whatever, whatever, there's absolutely no parameter that is 100%, 100% perfect. So the only way to survive in the middle of that huge storm is no other way than looking at the trends. But I couldn't agree more with Professor Kamal. Most of the of, of the of the colleagues, most of the doctors, they don't even know that there's a train graphs. I mean, they don't even know where's the where's the, the train graphs. And from my point of view, at least, and this is of course, this is a personal point of view, you know. But from, from my point of view, from my personal point of view, the most relevant and important screen on the machine is specific the train, the train machine, because it's the only one that you can usually really allow. You know, it's because it's, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, if you say, okay, I'm, I'm getting there because I'm getting, I'm hitting my mark and my mark is this parameter and this number on this parameter, but that's not the parameter. It's the whole idea and the whole idea, the answer to the whole idea is through the trend. And the other thing that is extremely, extremely important is to realize that the physiopathological speaking, the clothing and clogging is completely different. The clothing, and when we are talking about the clothing, we're talking about a reaction, a, a body reaction every time that we withdraw the blood from the patient and, and put it into, the, into, into a machine, we will activate the coagulation system. This, this is natural. This is, this is a natural reaction. It's, it's, it's always happening again and again. But the problem is that the clots, first, <clears throat> the, 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 the red clot and later on the, the, the white clot, we locate it on the hollows on the on the on the membrane so the filter the, the, the filter pressure will rise now if we talk about clogging the situation is completely different because it's about a deposit but from proteins and red blood red blood cells is is another different things and will affect much more the whole system not just the filter the filter again we have to think about 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 what's going on and how to solve it up we have to think constantly and we have to reset again and again and again um, uh, Arm was saying, okay, I, I will take it again, again, maybe in four hours. I will do it in two hours or in one hour, depending on the, on the patient's condition. I mean, there's no magic button. Again, there's absolutely no magic button. It's just us against the, 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 the patient's condition. And the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the secret is to reset again and again and again, and always thinking on what's going on on the machine and, 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 and the patient. There's something. There's something before before uh, before uh, before the, before ending. There's uh, a question here from Omar Rabi. Will you use the continuous renal replacement therapy in extreme cases of shock and lactic acidosis? Um, can I say yes? Is partial correction of lactic acidosis is beneficial and it will improve hemodynamics for improving the response to vasopressors? Yeah, yes, yes, uh, is and, and that's the that's the answer. If you want to. Uh, to have uh, some monodynamic response to the inotropes, you will need a pH over 7.2, 7.25, something like this. And the renal replacement therapy, the continuous renal replacement therapy, will help you get there, and you you, you will have an extra an extra power coming from the from the inotropes. Professor Kamal, what do you think about about getting there with the pH and the, and the continuous renal replacement therapy on the on the severe lactic acidosis again uh you know it's, it's, uh, definitely metabolic acidosis uh is a very serious condition the the word the ph the worst the outcomes uh of course definitely one of the worst outcomes also the pressure dropping of the patient and so on. correcting the ph per se is good for the patient L let's all be agreeing on that correcting that acidosis is always going to be good for the patient CRT or, or RRT in general will always do the job, the job of diffusion. 
uh, bicarbonate, as you know, is a small molecule. And when we are using, uh, for example, dialysate with high bicarbonate level, like 32 millimole or 35 millimole, which is what we do in the uh, in CRRT, the patient bicarbonate uh, is very low, for example, um, 15 uh, millimole. Uh, therefore, 30 millimole, 15 millimole, by diffusion, you will keep giving him bicarbonate throughout the treatment. So giving the patient bicarbonate will eventually improve his serum bicarbonate level because I'm giving him, uh, and eventually his pH if it's a problem of metabolic acidosis. Uh, lactic acidosis per se is a different issue because yeah. then the factory is still producing. So your lactate levels will still be plus eight, plus six. I cannot do anything about that. Uh, whether it's CRRT or uh, other, I can improve the pH, yes. I can improve bicarbonate levels, yes, but lactate, unless you give the right antibiotic, the right IV fluids, uh, uh, I will not treat the patient. I will not treat the hypoperfusion as a CRRT. My job is clearance and diffusion, and I will do the diffusion very well by, by giving more bicarbonate uh, as we go. Yes, Dr. Uh, ben Bello Matayo is asking something that is, 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 is a very common question. What is the different filter pressure between filter pressure and TMP. Professor, what do you think? The difference between the yes. filter pressure and the TMP, that's that's a, a very regular, regular and common question. Yes, so filter pressure uh, is always positive. Uh, how do we measure the filter pressure? Filter pressure is the, you know, the detector or the transducer right before the filter. What's the difference between filter and access? Access pressure is before the blood pump, so it is minus, minus 10, minus 15, whatever. The other one is after the blood pump and before the filter, so it's always positive, positive 50, positive 60. What causes you know, filter pressure to rise? What happens is a block after the filter pressure. So the same as what I explained, high filter clotting or filter clogging, both of them will increase the filter pressure. A block in the venous chamber will also increase the filter pressure. A block in the venous or the blue return line. All these three reasons will cause a rise in the filter pressure going from, for example, positive 100 to positive 150. So filter pressure uh, is, is, is very important. TMP is the transmembrane pressure. Transmembrane pressure, it is the difference between the pressure of the blood and the dialysate. So delta difference between the blood pressure and the dialysate pressure. The blood pressure is measured by the filter pressure minus the return pressure. So the pressure of the blood going in minus the return of the pressure going out divided by two. So the average blood pressure you inside the filter minus the dialysate pressure. How do we get the dialysate pressure? We have another pressure transducer in the effluent pump after the effluent comes out, telling us the pressure in the effluent. If you take the, uh, the blood minus the dialysate, you get the transmembrane pressure. Practically speaking, what does that make a difference for a nurse? The uh, filter pressure will rise earlier than transmembrane pressure. So there is an accumulation of the pressure inside the uh, filter, uh, uh, the you will find this 100 becomes 120, 130, 150. If the nurse ignores the filter pressure alarm, later on, the transmembrane alarm will start uh, uh, rising because then <laughs> the difference between the pressure of the blood and the dialysate will become higher and you will get the TMP, the famous TMP alarm that is very, you know, usually indicating filter clotting uh, and termination of uh, the circuit. There's a, can I can I bring up a question quickly? So yes, there's, a nice, there's a nice question by Dr. Benya. It's a simple question. He says, is filter clotting an indication to replace the filter or just do changes and proceed? Um, it's an interesting question because we've just a few minutes ago, we were talking a lot about effluent dose. And obviously, when we speak about effluent dose, intuitively, we're speaking about clear uh, dialysis clearance as well. And I think it's important to bear in mind that when we're setting a dialysis dose, for instance, an effluent dose of 30, when your filter is beginning to clot and has significant clotting in it, 
there is a very good chance that you are not delivering anywhere close to an effluent dose of uh, an equivalence, a clearance equivalence of 30, uh, even though your machine, you've, you've programmed your machine to do that. Because as you're losing surface area of the filter, you're losing the effectiveness and the clearance uh, that that filter has to offer. So my, my pragmatic answer to that question is, if my filter is, if there are signs that my filter is clotting, I would be very concerned and already be planning within the next few hours or so to do a filter change because the likelihood is that I'm not getting effective or good uh, number one clearance from that and number two, I might end up having a situation where my filter clots without me being able to reverse the blood and then, you know, uh, if the filter clots and you can't reverse blood, then you also lose a lot of blood and it's just a failure of the whole process. If you are, are, are not really you're looking after your filters, changing the filter before the blood clots in the filter and the whole entire system just full of blood and you discard that. So that is a very important question. I would do, definitely do something about uh, TMPs and, and signs that your filter is clotting, but have a more advanced plan that you know within the next few hours, I need to change this filter probably altogether. Very nice, very nice. I think for the sake of the time, we can stop by here. Um, of course, the, the workshop was longer, so we don't have uh, a chance to keep going for now. Um, so I really appreciate the, all your uh, both the feedback, contribution, active participation. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamel Attar. Thanks, Dr. Jacob and Dr. Craig. Thanks for uh, Dr. Rola and Dr. Khaled Swafi and all of our um, fellows today at attendees. And we are going to create uh, another discussion in our uh, WhatsApp group about the appropriate dosing, the appropriate starting um, the blood flow uh, rate, what is the effluent dose um, uh, depending on the ideal body weight or adjusted or target body weight. And uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, you know unanswered the question in this webinar. We are going to try to answer and handle in the WhatsApp group. And with that said, uh, we are going to close the session for tonight and we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night, have a good day. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.